believing in God brings with it doubts and worries and in contemporary American culture the way to deal with that is through faith. So let's consider one of the very popular recent accounts of how faith and doubt should work together by William Lane Craig. Craig is the author of a widely popular book called Reasonable Faith, a bunch of other books as well. He's a debater, philosopher, theologian, uh, pastor, and a uh, go-to source for many people um, on this topic. And here are some of his thoughts about how a believer can maintain his faith and best deal with doubt. Uh, Dr. Craig, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, I'm William Lane Craig. I'm a research professor at Talbot School of Theology, and I'm a Christian philosopher and theologian. Um, it's the experience of many, uh, many Christian students who attend university uh, that they find their faith troubled uh, and they begin to have doubts. Sure. What advice would you give to someone who is experiencing serious doubts? Well, there's a number of things, I think, that I would say about that. First of all, I think that I would tell them that they need to understand the proper relationship between faith and reason. And my view here is that the way in which I know Christianity is true is first and foremost on the basis of the witness of the Holy Spirit in my heart, and that this gives me a self-authenticating means of knowing that Christianity is true wholly apart from the evidence. And therefore, if in some historically contingent circumstances the evidence that I have available to me should turn against Christianity, I don't think that that controverts the witness of the Holy Spirit. In such a situation, I should result, re, uh, regard that as simply a result of the contingent circumstances that I'm in, and that if I were to pursue this with uh, due diligence and with time, I would discover that in fact the evidence, if I could get the correct picture, would support exactly what the witness of the Holy Spirit tells me. So I think that's very important to get the relationship between faith and reason right. Otherwise, what that means is that our faith is dependent upon the shifting sands of evidence and argument which change from person to person, place to place, and generation to generation. Whereas the Holy Spirit and his testimony gives every generation and every person immediate access to a knowledge of God and the truth of, of Christianity that's independent of the shifting sands of time and place and person and historical contingency. The second thing I, I think I would say follows from that. What this means is that doubt is never simply an intellectual problem. There is always a spiritual dimension to doubt as well. There is an enemy of your souls, Satan, who, is, who hates you intensely and who is bent on your destruction and who will do everything in his power to see that your faith is destroyed. And therefore, when we have these intellectual doubts and problems, we should never look at them as something that is spiritually neutral or divorce them from the spiritual conflict that we're involved in. Rather, we need to take these doubts to God in prayer to admit them honestly, to talk to our Christian friends about them, to not stuff them or hide them. We need to deal with them openly and honestly and, and talk to people about them and, and seek God's help in dealing with them. I think, frankly, no human being in this lifetime will ever have all of his questions answered. Uh, there's always going to be a question bag on the shelf of unanswered questions that we haven't had time to deal with in this lifetime. So that the key to victory in the Christian life is not having all your questions answered. The key to victory is, how, is learning how to live with unanswered questions. That's the real key. How do you allow unanswered questions not to become destructive doubts? And I think part of the secret of that will be by cultivating your spiritual life, engaging in spiritual disciplines like prayer, meaningful worship, Christian music, sharing your faith with other people, being involved in Christian service, so that you will foster the witness of the Holy Spirit in your life, be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that when you come into the circumstances of doubt and the shifting sands of evidence and so forth, you aren't thrown into shipwreck because of that. Finally, I would encourage you Whenever you get the opportunity to take one of those questions out of the question bag and pursue it into the ground 
until you come to intellectual satisfaction with it. And I can say from my own personal experience that this is one of the most spiritually exhilarating and healthy things that you can do in your Christian life is to take some issue that has been a nagging doubt and make it the subject of a research project. Do a paper in your philosophy class on it or, or something like that and pursue it into the ground until you are intellectually satisfied with it. And it will free you from that ever being a source of doubt again in your life. And that is a wonderful experience. I've done that with a number of questions that I have had and it leaves you with the conviction that Christianity does indeed stand intellectually, head and shoulders above every ism or philosophy that it might compete with. But of course, as I say, we'll never empty the question bag completely. And so while this is a healthy exercise, the more fundamental task that we need to do is to how to learn to live with unanswered questions without allowing them to become destructive doubts. Dr. Craig, thank you for your time. You're welcome. There's a number of extraordinary claims here that deserve some special attention. Among other things, Craig has said, I know that Christianity is true on the basis of the witness of the Holy Spirit in my heart. He says, this gives me a self-authenticating means of knowing that Christianity is true wholly apart from the evidence. So a very good question, a central question, among other things here to ask about what Craig has said is what is this witness of the Holy Spirit in my heart? What exactly is this sense of God that he's describing? So we should make some distinctions between mystical experiences and religious experiences. Mystical experiences are powerful altered states of consciousness with extraordinary feelings or sensations or experiences that are usually utterly unlike ordinary consciousness. Mystics often fall into trances and report seeing or feeling things that no one else who might be present can experience. They also often report that the experience is ineffable or incapable of being adequately described with words. Successfully communicating some sense of what has gone, what they've gone through, can be very difficult, particularly to someone who has not had a similar experience. I'd like to define religious experience more broadly. I'd like it to include, but not be limited to, mystical experience. These are also subjective. They often involve powerful emotions or thoughts, and they are often taken to be indicative of God's presence in the world. A religious experience can be as common as having a profound feelings of unity or awe or the presence of God on observing a sunset or a beautiful work of art. Religious experiences for our purposes are more common than full-blown mystical experiences or altered states of consciousness. So the witness of the Holy Spirit that Craig is talking about appears to be something slightly different in an important couple of ways, especially in epistemological ways, different than religious or mystical experiences. What are they? What is this witness? Well, here's what Craig says in another source. Craig says, well, the witness of the Holy Spirit is experience of the Holy Spirit is veridical and unmistakable, though not necessarily irresistible or indubitable for him who has it, that such a person who does not need supplementary arguments or evidence in order to know and to know with confidence that he is, in fact, experiencing the Spirit of God that such experience does not function in this case as a premise in any argument from religious experience to God, but rather is the immediate experiencing of God himself. That in certain contexts the experience of the Holy Spirit will imply the apprehension of certain truths of the Christian religion, such as God exists, I am condemned by God, I am reconciled to God, Christ lives in me, and so forth that such an experience provides one not only with a subjective assurance of Christianity's truth, but with objective knowledge of that truth, and that arguments and evidence incompatible with that truth are overwhelmed by the experience of the Holy Spirit for him who attends fully to it. There are really a number of remarkable things here that make this a special category of, uh, of argument or contact with God. So let's see if we can unpack some of the ideas here and see if we can make sense of it. First off, Craig makes the claim that this experience, when he has it, is self-authenticating. Well, what does that mean? Well, ordinarily, knowledge claims about the world are intersubjectively verifiable. 
That is to say, if there's an elephant in the room, then everybody at the table can look at it and see it, and they can agree or disagree about what's going on in the room. So across subjects, there can be some agreement. And different subjects use each other as a kind of error checking, uh, not a perfect error checking method, but at least a way to check. You, you nudge the guy next to you and say, is that an elephant in the room? And if he says yes, then you've got some more evidence than just your feelings or your sensations that perhaps there is an elephant in the room. If he says no, then maybe you think, well, this is just subjective only. Maybe this is just in my mind. Typically, knowledge claims about the world are defeasible. That is, we're prepared to change our minds about them if the evidence should change. Um, if new test results come in from the doctor that disprove uh, the old ones, or if a second um, a mechanic looks at your car and decides that the oil leak is actually coming from the oil filter, not from the oil pan, and there's more evidence that comes to light, then we change our mind about the thing we believed before. And we do this in part because we know that our ideas are um, possibly wrong, that we make mistakes. They're corrigible. That is to say, uh, we make mistakes. We know we make mistakes. So we check around, and we gather evidence, and we're prepared to change our minds because we know that the first thing we thought might be mistaken. And you know, we all have lots and lots of these examples in our lives. Uh, evidence concerning these sorts of the ordinary claims, they're public. Uh, phenomena. That elephant is a public phenomena. It's something that different people can access. It's a spatial temporal phenomena. We can put the elephant on a scale and we can all look at the scale and see how much it weighs. We can measure it. We can all uh, confirm that it uh, has the dimensions it has and so on. So typically knowledge claims about the world and the evidence that we use to support them have all of these features. They typically are not self-authenticating. The, the feeling that something's true or the subjective sense that something's true by itself is not enough to settle the question of whether or not it's right. But Craig, however, seems to think that the witness of the Holy Spirit is different. Unlike elephants, test results at the doctor, or a leaking pipe under the sink, or the murder weapon with the defendant's fingerprints on it, this experience, the one that Craig's having, the witness of the Holy Spirit, is something that only he can have, or maybe somebody else, but it's private, it's perfect, it's unassailable. It can't be shared, you can't experience, because it's inside. So it's not like the elephant in the room, it's something he's feeling on the inside. He can tell you about it, he can describe it, but that's different than to have it. Now typically, public evidence is prescriptive. I can point at the elephant and I can say, look, there it is. You should believe it too. And you rub your eyes and you check with somebody else and we all agree, yes, it's there. For, so for somebody then to look at it and acknowledge um, that they're having those sensations and then to say, no, it's not there, is for them to make a mistake. They're being irrational. Or for uh, another example, imagine being on a jury and imagine the uh, prosecuting attorney presenting a huge list of comprehensive evidence that shows someone's guilt. For you to look at that and then not accept it is for you to be uh, unreasonable. You're denying the obvious, you're ignoring the evidence. To deny the conclusion in that case would be epistemically culpable. We'd find you uh, to blame in that kind of case. Now, the thing that's going on here with Craig and his special access to God is not like this. It's not subject to that kind of scrutiny, that kind of doubt, that kind of undermining. What happens then if new evidence comes up that seems to contradict this special witness of the Holy Spirit? Well, Craig has said uh, in my quote and also in the video that new evidence that might undermine the belief doesn't controvert the witness of the Holy Spirit because it's a special sort of experience. Rather, given enough time and thought and the correct picture of the world, it will become clear that all evidence is consistent with the Christian faith, no matter what comes up. The appearance of contradiction is just a contingency of what I am going through, thinking about, or being exposed to at the moment. So for Craig, this witness of the Holy Spirit is providing him with a piece of knowledge that around which everything else has to conform. Think of it this way. Uh, his faith comes first, reasoning and evidence comes second. So on Craig's approach, you believe, by the way of the witness of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus Christ is our Savior, or, or whatever the conclusion might be. 
And then secondary, only afterwards, if you encounter evidence, you find a way to make that evidence conform. If it seems to support it, then fine, we accept it. If it seems to controvert it, if it seems to contradict the evidence, then you find a way, what does he say? Drive it into the ground. Find a way to rationalize and reconstruct and build it so that that can be made to fit. Now by contrast, the other approach to reasoning, conclusions, and evidence that we're more familiar with, the one we do in science, the evidentialist approach we've been considering all semester long, does it this way. First, you conduct a broad, unbiased search for evidence. And that search itself is not directed uh, prior towards any particular conclusion. You want to gather all of it. That search itself is equally receptive to any possible outcome. And then once we gather all the evidence and we're satisfied that we've got a broad representative uh, body of all the relevant evidence, then we draw the conclusion that's best supported by that evidence without prior favor for a particular outcome. So what's happening in the in Craig's approach is that the belief is driving the investigation. It's driving the reasoning. It's motivating the uh, conclusions so that we make all of the evidence fit it. Whereas in the evidentialist approach, there's no prior expectation. We gather evidence, and then we accept whatever conclusion happens to result radically different approaches uh, to figure out what's going on in the world. Craig's saying that his knowledge of God has this special, extraordinary kind of feature. That is, in more technical terms, Craig has an indefeasible basic belief that God is real. This is a belief that you're not willing to revise under any circumstances, and one that is not arrived at through any process of reasoning or inference. It's immediate and direct knowledge of its object. These beliefs, if they are right, if we have these sorts of things, are allegedly intrinsically justified, is what Craig has said. Okay, now if you haven't thought it already, you ought to be worried about a few things here because I think there's some real problems with the way this is being described. First off, we know that the human cognitive system is highly prone to lots of biases, errors, fallacies, and peculiar faulty outputs. We also know that people are highly prone to be superstitious and religious and produce also all manner of supernatural ideas. And in many cases, people have very strong, powerful supernatural ideas um, that they have uh, comparably deep convictions about that are in stark conflict with the claim that Craig is making. That is to say, the view that Jesus Christ is the one and only savior of humankind is not compatible with, say, um, some Muslim view of the world or some Jewish view of the world or some Hindu view of the world or some Buddhist view of the world where there is some stark assertion about the ultimate nature of reality. Those are exclusive. So there's other people that have ideas that they presumably would hold with just as much conviction. And I suppose they could say that they have the witness of the Holy Spirit in their heart that those conclusions are right. Now, we all know good and well that lots of people make lots of mistakes along these lines. So is it wise to take the output outputs of of uh, one of these outputs that's highly contentious, one of these ideas, his idea about Jesus or God, put brackets around that one, and then you declare about that one, this idea is completely certain, it's utterly beyond question, this feeling I'm having cannot possibly be mistaken, and the reasonable thing to do is to take all evidence I encounter and either find a way to make it conform or just flat out reject it. This ought to be bothering us, I think, for a couple of different reasons. So one of them, I've already suggested, is that is error checking. We know, and there is a mountain of empirical evidence now, 
that humans make all sorts of reasoning mistakes. Here's a very short list of some of the recent research coming from Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, who both won the Nobel Prize for their investigations into just this question. And here's a short list of some of the peculiar, glitchy, biased, um, strange mistakes that humans reliably, consistently make when they're put into certain kinds of environments. And lots of these have to do with religious or supernatural or magical beliefs. So that is to say, we know for a fact that humans are not, uh, do not have incorrigible, faultless belief making uh, modules in their brains. Here's a mountain of evidence to the contrary. Okay, so the first problem here is that Craig seems to be suggesting that he's got a very strong truthy feeling about this particular belief being right and it's so powerful that he's willing to reject everything else uh, in favor of it. And the mistake I think is that uh, none of our ideas ought to be trusted with that much uh, confidence. Now here's another problem. Is the witness of the Holy Spirit prescriptive? That is, can someone who believes on these grounds recommend to somebody else that they ought to believe it too. Now we saw back with the elephant or with the test results that come from the doctor that if somebody else can look at it, if another mechanic can look at your transmission, if another doctor can do some tests and we can all look at the evidence and publicly uh, verify that it's there, we can now say of each other, or the defense attorney, or the sorry, the prosecuting attorney and a jury can say to the jury, you ought to convict this defendant because here's the evidence, and the evidence shows that he's guilty. For you not to do so would be for you to make a mistake. You should. I'm prescribing that you draw this conclusion. Now, can Craig do something like that? Can Craig recommend that the rest of us do likewise? Or can Craig say that somebody who doesn't have this powerful conviction of the Holy Spirit, can he say of them that they're mistaken? I think, at the very least, given his description of the path he's taking, he can't find epistemic fault with those who do not do likewise or those who don't have a similar sort of feeling. Furthermore, Craig can't use argument or reason now to convince someone who has not subjugated their reasoning to their faith the way he has that they are being unreasonable for not doing the same. Notice that Craig has said that there can be no evidence or argument that could controvert his theism. So he said, this is a belief that will that I will um, put preeminent or prior to any other reasonable concerns. So that means Craig has said, there are no reasons even hypothetically that I would allow that might uh, lead me to revise this view. It's an incorrigible view. So how can Craig then turn around and argue, as we saw with the Kalam argument and other sources, can he then say, you who don't believe this conclusion, you ought to accept this conclusion on the basis of this evidence? When in effect, Craig has said here, really at the end of the day, evidence doesn't make any difference. I don't care about evidence. If I run into evidence that doesn't seem to support my view, then I either just reject it or I find a way to make it fit. That seems like Craig is playing with a loaded deck or there's a kind of double standard, a couple of different sets of rules here. Craig's debating people about whether or not it's reasonable to believe in God, but of course he's not going to allow that anything, even hypothetically, could undermine his belief in God. So what exactly is going on here? It doesn't seem like he can, can insist with an argument that somebody who doesn't do likewise is epistemically obligated to do the same, or they're culpable, or they're being unreasonable for not doing the same, because he just says ultimately reason ought to be subjugated to this belief you have, so reason is not the ultimate arbiter of the whole thing, so how can that be the tool or the medium by which he uses to try to convince somebody else? That is. It doesn't appear, given what he said here, that Craig can argue that someone who disagrees with him is mistaken. He can't say they're wrong. Because he said ultimately the grounds for deciding what's right and wrong are subjugated. He's not going to permit any sort of dissent on this point. Okay, so call this the subversion of argument problem, and it stems from Craig's prioritizing faith over reason rather than putting reason first and the conclusion second. <clears throat> Another problem. 
We encountered this elsewhere. We're going to call this the floodgate problem too. Suppose an ardent follower of Peluga or or Sobek or Gefjun or a popular recent choice, the flying spaghetti monster, were to make a parallel case. Suppose some adherent to the flying spaghetti monster said, I have self-authenticating feeling in my mind that the flying spaghetti monster is the one true supernatural creator of the universe, and I will subordinate all other considerations to my faith. I will find a way to make any evidence conform because I cannot be wrong about this. Now, you'd think that's outrageous. If somebody if anybody, if I lined up a hundred different people, all of them espousing the same sort of utterly convinced conclusion about the nature of their god, their spaghetti monster, uh, their great pumpkin, their Gefjun, their Thor, or whoever, you'd think that person had just left the rationality playing field. This is someone who's announced that they simply aren't going to play by any rules. They're going to have this belief and they will not listen to any contrary views. And if Craig is going to pull that move, it looks like the floodgates are now open for everybody to do exactly the same thing. On what ground now can we judge between these different competing hypotheses, these different competing adherents to these different supernatural entities? We've got tens of thousands or millions of different entities and people claiming to have the witness of the Holy Spirit or the witness of the Holy Spaghetti that that's their view and it cannot possibly be right, uh, be wrong. Um, how can we possibly arbitrate between all of these? Or why should we trust any of them? Why should we think any of them is making any sense at all, other than they've just decided, I'm going to take my ball and I'm leaving, I'm not going to play the game, I'm going to take it and go home, I'm not playing the, reason, uh, the, the rationality game with you guys. So this is the floodgate problem, and it strikes me as a very serious problem to uh, Craig's argument. Now Craig, uh, as is often the case, has a response that he thinks serves here. He says that were these other considerations, these other doubts or other worries to come up that might controvert the witness of the Holy Spirit, this thing, this experience, this special sense of God that he has is itself and it has an intrinsic defeater defeater. Now what does that mean? A defeater to his view would be an objection or a consideration that one could come to believe that would be incompatible with the theistic belief. So if there was evidence, for example, that showed that Jesus' miraculous resurrection from the dead didn't really happen, then that conclusion, if it was right, would defeat the belief that the resurrection did happen. Now what does Craig say then about that? Hypothetically, if there were to be evidence that showed that Jesus did not miraculously rise from the dead, what does Craig say um, that how that evidence or that argument would fit in the face of the witness of the Holy Spirit. Craig says, by asserting that it's an intrinsic defeater defeater, says that the witness of the Holy Spirit is an immediate non-inferential sense of the presence of God in the world that is so powerful and so assuring that it intrinsically undermines any other critical ideas that one could possibly have. So Craig says no matter which one of those might come up, this special feeling is so powerful, so incorrigible, and the way he knows that is because the way it feels, it feels so truthy, for lack of a better word, it, it is so intrinsically assuring that it will shoot down any of those possible contrary views. Now I'm not sure at all that this has answered, say, the floodgate problem, I don't know why the flying spaghetti monster adherent is not entitled to say the very same thing, same thing. That my powerful sense of the immediate direct existence of the flying spaghetti monster is so powerful that it, it serves as an intrinsic defeater defeater. 
So I don't see how this answers the objection at all. Now later in the video Craig does say well once you uh, make the leap, once you get within this sort of system and you engage in this process of running into the ground and working out ways in which to uh, solve problems in favor of your conclusion, you will see that Christianity stands head and shoulders above all other isms as an intellectually uh, and philosophically superior view. Well, it really sounds like what Craig has done here is said, once you get inside and you accept the view that this is an intrinsically intellectually superior view, and then you utterly commit yourself to defending that view at all costs, and you find ways, by all means, to render objections down so that they fit or so that they no longer produce cognitive dissonance and that you feel satisfied, then you can turn around and conclude, yes, this seems to be a intellectually superior uh, position, a greater ism than all the other isms. But, but it sounds suspiciously like um, Craig is saying, well, until you believe and you believe with utter conviction, you won't believe with utter conviction. But I can't see how this possibly can serve as an argument for why others ought to adopt this view. And honestly, I can't see why we should now take Craig seriously when he wants to argue or pseudo reason with us about what the evidence shows. Um, it would be a mistake to engage in one of those discussions with Craig when given our two different procedures one person might be engaged in a genuine broad-based objective search for evidence and then wanting to find out what conclusion is actually supported by that evidence but Craig come to find out is engaged in well believing in Jesus first and then finding a way to make all the evidence fit now those two people might have what looks to be a on the board uh, honest difference of opinion and a, a genuine debate about what the best conclusion is but Craig is playing by a different set of rules Craig is not will not consider the possibility that what he's what he is arguing for could possibly be, mis be mistaken and I think that that's a serious blow to Craig's credibility okay so in conclusion We've discovered from Craig in his inquiry into the question of doubt and faith that he claims to know God through uh, wholly independent from any evidence through the private witness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that belief, he has said, steers his investigation of the evidence rather than his evidence motivating some other conclusion that's not prior, that doesn't have a prior um, direction or that hasn't been determined uh, beforehand. Craig's belief is indefeasible by his own admission. There appears to be no new information, even hypothetically, that he would allow as counter indicating his faith. He is determined to take all of those unanswered questions and either hold them off or render them so that he, they can be made compatible. This approach, I've argued, faces the error checking problem, the subversion of argument problem, and the floodgate problem. In response, Craig insists that the witness of the Holy Spirit is such that it defeats these and any other possible objections. It has uh, an intrinsic defeater, defeater built in.